and know everyone. Yes. Welcome back to the fourth panel. <laughs> Our first speaker is Mohak Ruhina, and she will be speaking on Ajar portraiture painting and reframing of Iranian art materials. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mahaj, and uh, thank you for attending to our presentation. And thank you for uh, Professor, the Professor to uh, giving us this um, opportunity. Uh, my um, presentation is Bajar Porte Painting and the uh, Reframing of Iranian Art Modernity. Uh, Qajar period from the year 1789 uh, to 1925, one of the most important historical and political periods in Iran, is also considered an important and influential period in the field of art and uh, literature. Qajar period marks uh, various social and political changes in Iran. Following these changes, art also involved to reflect the conditions of the Iranian society. The evolution and the modernization of art had started in Safavid period, but it found a more rapid pace during Bajar period. Uh, Qajar painting is uh, generally divided into two periods. Uh, the first period, which begins with the reign of uh, Fatali Shah and continues until the end of Muhammad Shah's reign, um, has its roots in the art of the Safavid and Zen periods. Portraits were one of the remarkable themes in Qajar uh, painting. Um, in this painting, the figures of the Shah or princes were depicted in various poses, either seated or standing. Attention to detail in facial uh, features and the portrayal of personality traits were of uh, primary importance in these uh, depictions. The Shah gathered some of the most uh, prominent artists in the capital, Tehran, and assigned them to paint large canvases to be uh, installed in the new palaces of Tehran. Thank you. Uh, Fatali Shah, who looked up to Sasanian kings and was inspired by the aesthetic, he had uh, artists to shape his figure. The prominent relief in uh, Shahrirei, it's a city near to Tehran, is one example of such artworks which were created to resemble a Sasanian style. According to Oleg Grabar, only this change in the size of images can be considered an absolute break from the past. He believes that uh, this change was not sudden and uh, accidental um, and that such a uh, rupture in Iranian culture occurred at the time, uh, the late uh, 18th and early 19th centuries, when a similar cultural rupture had spread throughout Europe and Asia. Uh, relating this trend to the tradition of Western art is somewhat uh, natural, although it is not clear whether the large canvases of Itali Italian uh, and French paintings were known in Iran at that time. Uh, during this period, a specific location such as a, a niche in a particular part of a palace uh, would be commissioned for artwork. The artist would select the frame suitable for that location, leading to artwork featuring ornate uh, and art, art shape in the upper sections. In, in other words, uh, new forms were created in, in artworks in uh, response to practical factors in the environment and this was an innovation in the artwork uh, of that time, of that period. Another characteristic of this period was the unique relationship between art 
uh, and literature. According to Abbas Amonak, the artists of this period drew an inspiration from literature and poetry in the uh, works and used li uh, literary description to better uh, represent faces and bodies. For example, some of the common themes in paintings of the time were bold and uh, elongated eyes, slender waist, small mouth, um, which are all among uh, the beautiful description in the literature of that time. In the second half of Qajar period, which uh, lasted until the end of Ahmad Shah's reign, art was no longer limited to the court and under the uh, monarch's influence and um, control, but uh, it, it became more popular and painter gained uh, relative independence. Nasser Din Shah's reign was um, uh, um, was um, simultaneous? Simultaneous? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, with the development of the printing industry, the establishment of uh, Daru Fonun, the creation of the modern uh, army, the emergence of newspapers, the spread of uh, democratic ideas, the contact with Western culture, and the trans uh, translation of European literature and, uh, and science, um, the evolution of Persian and uh, prose and system, emergence of uh, photography, and the effect of this industry on the art of painting. Um, in the painting of Nasser Din Shah's era, the painting the scale become smaller compared to the past. According to many researchers, the depiction of the human form in Qajar paintings was influenced by a Western human, uh, humanistic perspective. Although some scholars like Grobar do not consider this theory uh, definitive. In the paintings of this era, the human figure uh, dominates all other elements of the uh, composition. Um, ex uh, exerting its control both in terms of size and emphasize on the composition of the image. Uh, during this period, Iranian uh, paintings moved away from idealistic representation and uh, lean toward um, realist to some extent. After the Safavid era, the ideal, idealized human figure gave way to a semi-worldly beings, primarily focused on portraying its luxurious appearance. Grubber also suggests that these images, uh, without being traditional, are authentic, because authenticity does not necessarily stem from tradition. He considered these examples as authentic modernity. In these artworks, a kind of uh, populism is evident and attempt to find a way to uh, present knowledge, ideas, uh, and wills in a language understandable to everyone. The emergence of uh, photography can be considered one of the main reasons uh, for a um, evolvement of art between the early and late Qajar periods. In Sharaf and Sharafat, uh, one of the well-known newspapers of that time, um, portraits were drawn with great uh, attention to details, confirming the assumption that they were drawn from photographs. Photographs. As photography became more common, painter started making a sketch based on photos rather than using live model. Uh, some scholars consider this shift as a step toward modernism in Iranian art. Another significant, significant factor that deeply influenced the evolution of painting during the Qajar period was the travel to court artists to Europe. Uh, Abul Hassan Khan, known as Sani Ul Mulk, was sent by court of Muhammad Shah to Italy to learn Western techniques of painting. During this trip to Italy, he was able to master the principles of Western painting and was inspired by 
uh, that in his paintings. He has spent uh, approximately five years in Italy um, dedicating himself to learning painting. During this time, he studied and copied the works of uh, renowned painters such as Titian, uh, Michelangelo, and Raphael. However, Samuel Mont, um, uh, however, uh, Samuel Mont's main achievement from his European journey was not merely copying Europeans, but rather focusing on the realistic uh, aspects of life in his work. As you might know, till then, traditional Iranian painting never aimed to represent na uh, nature as specific individuals or as specific uh, places, but has always thought um, to depict and idealize timeless and placeless paradise. However, upon his return to uh, Iran, Sani Olmolk, uh, began to depict more of people and even around him. He portrayed individuals he encountered in, um, in the Nasser court, Ali and Marcus, as well as ordinary people, friends, and acquaintances. Um, he managed to preserve his uh, intellectual independence in his works and bridge a gap between European painting uh, principles with Iranian painting. Opening up a new path in the art of painting during uh, his time. He was also able to incorporate uh, satire and humor into his works, which wasn't common before him. Uh, in general, the art of the first half of Qajar period can be seen as more traditional and less influenced by the cultural and social changes of the Qajar era. Uh, in the art of second half of this period, painting managed to reconcile European tradition with tra traditional Persian aesthetic uh, standards and present uh, innovative art. Social changes, photography, and printing altered the course of Iranian art and guided it toward a more uh, naturalistic and modern art. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Awesome. Original work? Uh, this is not <laughs> uh, Any questions? Yes, please. I miss something. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> Actually, he combined a sort of uh, a European style uh, in uh, Iranian style and make a new style for him at that time. And uh, um, also he knows um, uh, about um, perspective in that time. And sometimes uh, he um, didn't use this ability to uh, his work. His artwork. Uh, Thank you very much. Any other? No. Uh, this image is a great transitional photo image drawing from art modernity to retro modernity. Paria de Souza McDonald. <laughs> we'll be speaking on Iranian retro modernism and the female body. Retro modernity. Yeah. One second, sorry. <laughs> you have a lot of stuff, right? Thank you, Mohan. Yay, okay. Um, 
everyone just let me know, first of all, if you can hear me. Um, I know that I'm not sitting directly in front of the computer, so let's see. Uh, Hi, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties we're experiencing. I'm going to try to um, fix my screen sharing as well so I can, because uh, it seems like the slides aren't uh, changing when I share. Just to confirm, can you guys see that I'm presenting the slideshow? It's not just like Microsoft Word on my no, it's thing. Your, Here's your screen. You. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Yay. Because speakers screen it's before we're no Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm so sorry. This, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, what? Yeah, I do. My bad, my bad, my bad. Um, what is happening? I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, photography was introduced to Iran only three years after it was introduced in the West in 1842. However, it was six years uh, later, six to 10, uh, during the reign of Nasser ad-Din Shah Qajar, that photography became the dominant medium of artistic expression in Iran, supplanting the local painting tradition. However, the intent behind its introduction were decidedly political. Lithographs were meant to accompany and illustrate a court newspaper that would serve as a propaganda outlet for the Shah. Nevertheless, Nasser ad-Din took her- Oh, you have to. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, Nasser ad Din took a personal interest in photography. The archive at Gulistan Palace contained upwards of 40,000 photographs, 20,000 of which were taken by Nasser ad Din himself. Qajar painting had, in part due to contact with the West and Western art, gradually shifted towards a more naturalistic style. And while photography was a logical conclusion to this progression, the styles and subjects now employed by public photographers borrowed heavily from the Europeans who had introduced the medium to Iran. So this is a photo by one of the you know, more famous project photographers, Ant Antoine Severguin. Um, yeah, um, so he's uh, an Iranian photographer of Armenian and Georgian descent who had really unprecedented access to the court harem. Um, and while this uh, photograph, its composition isn't necessarily as erotic as a lot of uh, the compositions being made by like true sort of European photographers uh, in Iran, there's still these really, you know, classic orientalist motifs of uh, the rug and the hookah and the some legs, some legs exactly, <laughs> stocking legs um, being shown bare. Um, so this was both a pretty innovative and contradictory period of photography. Uh, Nasser ad-Din Shah really believed in the power of photography as uh, a means for portraying the world as it was. It was a, a sort of means for technical um, like recording of history, there was ethnographic value to it. Um, it was taught at the Dar al Fanun uh, as a science along with, you know, math and physics. Um, but uh, court photographers still sort of experimented with different techniques to alter light, clarity, sharpness. But uh, photography still took on a quite orientalist tone. Um, images, even ones like this, who are captured by people sort of argue that he's not native, but he was born and raised in Iran. He spent his life there. He was working with Iranian uh, patrons and subjects. So I would call Antoine Severin uh, an Iranian photographer. Um, they were posed in a way that really sort of fed the idea of the exotic East. Um, and uh, uh, really related to this, um, self-orientalizing tendency uh, of earlier photography is the sense of nostalgia for the Qajar golden era of photography. Um, and uh, sort of 
another retro modernist of the 20th century, Bahman Jalali, uh, complains that every time the spheres of power in Iran shift, there's this desire to purge the visual landscape from any evidence of the previous regime. So uh, the shift to the Pahlavi regime uh, from the Qajar period really uh, all of the sort of photographs, a lot of them were sequestered into archives or just straight up destroyed. Um, and the sort of experimental portraiture and the playfulness that you find in a lot of the Qajar photographs was really sort of uh, uh, marginalized um, when uh, you know Reza Shah was really interested in photography as a means of um, making ideology more accessible to a wider population. When he came to power in 1925, uh, a large part of Iran was still illiterate. So um, making uh, like ideologically based photography for wide distribution was really important for him, especially in the context of uh, Pasha Hijab. Mm -hmm. um, he, sort of commissioned photographs of unveiled women in public sort of situations so that uh, people could really um, see them and see that like, oh, this is a thing that's happening now. This is a thing that's happening. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, and this is also a trend that like photography really becomes normalized during the Pahlavi period um, in, I believe it's 1920, it's either 1923 or 1927, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's the um, establishment of like the birth registry laws right. and uh, there's a requirement for uh, sort of Western style identification cards. And those require you sit for a portrait. So photography, it, which used to be really sort of relegated to the upper classes becomes something that is necessary for your, your citizenship. Like from luxury to basic. exactly, so. it becomes a, a sort of a, nece a necessity in public life, um, and that means because everyone now has to sit for a portrait, private photography studios start popping up all over the country, um, which also creates a culture of wedding photographs, which mm. I think is very fun. Um, that and that also is a sort of important ideological uh, moment because especially as a woman, if you're sitting for your wedding portrait and you're unveiled, that's a really public sort of action uh, of you expressing modernity. Um, I also think this period is quite interesting because although Reza Shah was really interested in promoting photography, um, you know, he was only really interested in promoting photography that he could control. Uh, so tourism, uh, tourists had to apply for special uh, permits and passes to photograph in Iran um, because he was really concerned that if people were allowed to sort of photograph whatever they wanted, they would start photographing the things about Iran that were still traditional or backwards, which was something he was really trying to push against. Um, it was sort of, I mean, all of his uh, commissioning of portraits of um, unveiled women was really to uh, create this idea of a modern westernized Iran uh, and he was not willing to uh, let anyone see that you know behind the scenes uh, that wasn't necessarily wholesale the case. Um, the Qajar period is also not the Qajar period, the Pahlavi period, what's happening? Yeah, is also the period that photography starts to be defined as a fine art. Um, in 1965, photographer Ahmad Ali uh, writes an essay, a catalog essay for a show of his in which he um, sort of redefines photography as something that is more uh, similar to painting in that um, the emotive qualities of photography should be considered in the technique. Uh, and he does a lot of work um, with his colleagues and contemporaries, uh, especially at this gallery, uh, to sort of build up a group of people who agree that photography should be considered a fine art. 
uh, and this moves moves on into uh, the post-revolutionary period, which was certainly, uh, you know, a, a rupture in the timeline of uh, photographic art in Iran. Um, the post-revolution intellectual centers were targeted, universities were closed for uh, two years, uh, and the new regime sort of moved back to this passive uh, idea of ideological photography. Um, they sort of encourage photographers to uh, capture things that embodied this sort of Islamic revolutionary spirit. Uh, and this was sort of re-upped by the war with Iraq. There was this desire to um, desire from the government for artists to be uh, bolstering nationalism. Um, and of course, uh, nudity and the female body were very limited. Um, you, you, nudity was banned in photography, in art photography, and uh, the female body could only be veiled. Um, so this is a sort of, uh, the, the female subject in Iranian photography um, becomes a sort of a fascination of diasporic Iranian photography. Um, and that is where uh, Shirin Nishat comes in. Um, but at this point, I'd like to take a step back. <laughs> I'd like to take a step back. Uh, and talk about the gaze as a motif in art. Um, so, uh, Sartre, uh, Jean Paul Sartre in Being in Nothingness talks about the look and the idea of, um, uh, what is it? It's uh, object, no, it's, what is it? Other as object. So, when you're looking at something, your gaze, your look is turning it from another being, another person into just a thing. Right. But if the, if the thing starts looking back at you, then you become a thing. Uh, and photography really sort of uh, elides that um, objectification of the viewer uh, in a way that Laura Mulvey talks about. Reification, is that what you were? Yes. <laughs> uh, in her um, essay on the male gaze, uh, which is in relation to cinema, but cinema is sort of the continuation of photography. Um, and uh, John Berger also in his uh, 1972, uh, it's a BBC short series, but it, it, there's a book that accompanies it called Ways of Seeing. Um, talks about the female nude uh, in this sense. Um, the, the audience of these images of the nude uh, is assumed to be a man. And because the audience is a man, uh, the woman, the nude is an object. She's standing sort of frontally. She's uh, projecting herself as something that's submissive, something that can be she can have things done to her and she can sort of fulfill the imagination of the viewer um, in a way that I think is sort of, you know, she's uh, she loses that agency. And this sort of in the context of, uh, you know, Middle Eastern subjects to photography, uh, there is that power dynamic of, um, you know, a Western viewer, these uh, Western photographers coming into the harem and photographing these women, posing them uh, to fit their fantasies. Um, so uh, finally, uh, I end my, oh, this is, this goes with that. <laughs> this is the sort of, Islamic art. <laughs> no, in fact, no. This is uh, Ang's uh, La Grande Odalisque, uh, as you can see, she's sort of offering herself up to the viewer um, and her uh, her sort of agency is so not there that she kind of loses the proportions of her that makes her human. Her arm is so much longer than the other. Her neck connects to her body in a way that's not real. This leg is super short, but this leg is crazy long. Um, 
she she's so contorted just so that there can be these sort of sensual curves for her male viewer. Um, and then finally, I uh, wanted to end my paper um, talking about nostalgia and bringing it back to Shireen Nishat. Um, so uh, this is where uh, Svetlana Boim's uh, theories of nostalgia comes in. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, she sort of outlines two primary um, methods or trends in nostalgia in art, uh, one of which is restorative nostalgia and one of which is reflective nostalgia. Uh, so restorative nostalgia is a very sort of serious um, using nostalgia as a way to connect to a sort of national past and a national future. Um, whereas reflective nostalgia is sort of, uh, it can be more playful and um, looking back to um, a sort of shared cultural and collective memory. It's more on, um, it's more on the algae side of nostalgia, the, the longing. Um, and I thought the sort of comparison of refle uh, restorative, what is it? Yeah, restorative and uh, reflective nostalgia is, um, you can sort of see it quite clearly in the comparison between um, Shadi Gaidirian and Shiri Nishat's photography. Um, Nishat, of course, her work is quite serious. There's not a lot of playfulness there. Um, she's discussing, you know, the sort of pain of violence, the rupture of the revolution, the uh, unclearness of her place in Iranian society as someone who left before the revolution and didn't come back until more than 10 years after. Um, whereas Badiryan is an artist who's working in Iran and has been working in Iran the entire time. She's actually a student of Bahman Jalali. Um, uh, and her work is really quite ridiculous. It, it plays on the absurd. It's this commentary on, uh, you know, she she poses her models like Hajar uh, portraits, like Hajar portraits, but adds in these modern props. There's a, a boombox, there's one with a vacuum, there's one with a can of Coca-Cola um, to sort of say, look how far we've come, but we haven't come anywhere at all. Um, but, but it also sets us really well for the next paper, the fashionable Iranian. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and what I sort of, one last point I wanted to end on uh, to sort of bring it all back to the Orientalism of it all is that while nostalgia is a really important tool for Nishat, uh, ignorance is as well. And it's not her ignorance, it's the ignorance of her audience. She, um, text plays a really large part in her work, but as an artist working in the West, uh, Farsi isn't really accessible to a lot of her audience. And um, she often doesn't provide translations to the text. It's sort of up to you to either know what it is already or search up the catalog. And she said in interviews before, she doesn't think it matters, um, even though she's putting in sort of, uh, this is a, a text from a Tahir Safar Sade poem um, talking about martyrdom and revolution. Um, but she also sort of um, blurs the distinction between Iranian and non-Iranian. Um, and her, you know, critics of her work do that as well. They tend not to make distinctions between Farsi and Arabic, and neither does she in her most recent film. Uh, the soundtrack was a uh, song sp uh, sung in Arabic by a Tunisian singer, um, which was, granted like an Arabic sort of cover of a, a Persian folk song, but the, the fact that it was in Arabic uh, allows 
her to sort of tap into more global uh, conversations about womanhood and Islam and uh, the veil and, you know, relationships with power and the West. Very good. Thank you much. Thank you. Any questions? No? Mm -hmm. um, uh, mothers, Iranian, but just Google work in Iran. World magazine went to Iran 1969 mm -hmm. because I did something for another was community. They went to Afghanistan and they went to Iran one. And they put um European women in the yeah, very modern uh, outfits and in front of a mosque or a, a person who is, uh, or I remember, I couldn't find it now, but this is one very, very like half naked woman with very beautiful European dress. And it's a mosque, and there's this clergyman also in here in the picture. I was looking. I didn't have to. <laughs> but it's interesting just to it's another Very good. Thank you much. Um our next presenters, Mariam Ziaoin, who will be speaking on fashionable Iranian youth, right? It was fashionable and musical. You know, no, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do Do you have a slide? So yeah, I emailed them. I, I I didn't receive them. So if you could send them again, please. She sent it to you. Oh. Is that you? No, it's not. It looks like she has blue eyes. Um, so my topic is fashionable Iranian youth. The evolution of fashion among Iranian youth speaks volumes about their resistance, adaptability, and the interplay between tradition and modernity. Iranian youth fashion has undergone significant transformations over the years, reflecting broader social, cu cultural, and political shifts within the country. These changes are indicative of a younger generation's desire to express their individuality, aspirations, and often their subtle forms of resistance against official norms and expectations. In this presentation, I will talk about how fashion has evolved in the pre-evolution era and to the present day. Sorry, hold on. So in the period leading up to the 1979 Islamic Revolution, Iran was undergoing a dramatic transformation embracing Western fashion trends and lifestyles. This era, specifically the 1960s and 1970s, saw the younger generation adopting a style that mirrored global fashion movements. Translated by the Shah's modernization efforts, which aimed at westernizing the country. Women's fashion was characterized by mini skirts and midi skirts, often paired with high boots, reflecting the influence of Western pop culture icons. Bell bottom pants became a staple among the youths worn with fitted tops to mimic the popular silhouettes seen in Europe and America. Evening and form and wear of women often include Western style dresses that featured bold prints, bright colors, and a variety of lengths. Hairstyles were voluminous and makeup was bold, showcasing the global trend of expressive personal style. Men on their part embraced short sleeved shirts, polo shirts, and for more formal occasions, they used suits and blazers that mirrored the sharp tailoring and slip suits popular in the West. Jeans and casual trousers signified a comfort and style blends previously uncommon, accessorized with wristwatches, sunglasses, and Western style footwear to complete their modern look. This era's fashion was more than mere clothing. It was a statement of modernity and a testament to Iran's openness to global influences. It reflected a desire for social change and highlighted the socioeconomic divide with such Western inspired lifestyles predominantly accessible to the urban middle and upper class. After the 1979 Islamic Revolution, the society of, under, of Iran went through a significant transformation, specifically in terms of appearance and fashion. 
The new regime aiming to establish a society rooted in Islamic principles imposed strict dress codes that reflected its ideological shifts away from Western influences and towards what is considered traditional Islamic values. For women, the most noticeable change was the mandatory wearing of the hijab, which required the covering of the hair and neck. This regulation was part of a broader dress code that also mandated the covering of arms and legs, leading to the widespread use of long, loose-fitting garments. Traditional attire like the chador became more prevalent. The government also encouraged the wearing of the manteau, which was worn over the clothing when they were in public. These garments were initially limited in color, mainly to black and other dark hues, to discourage any form of flashiness and to strictly follow the principles of modesty prescribed by the new regime. Men too faced restrictions, although less severe than for women. Men were expected to wear modest clothing, which typically meant long trousers and long sleeve shirts. Clothes that were too tight or made from overly luxurious material were frowned upon. The emphasis was on simplicity and, and modesty. Fashion and personal appearance became deeply political in post-revolution. Adhering to the new dress code was not just a matter of personal choice, but a public statement of loyalty and respect for the revolutional values and the new Islamic regime. The police was, were established to enforce these strict codes, ensuring compliance and punishing those who rebelled, which could range from fines to arrest. This era marked a significant departure from the pre-revolutionary period, an openness to the Western fashion and the expression of individuality through clothing. The imposed dress code was a symbol to solidify Islamic identity and to reject Western influence. During the 1990s and the early 2000s, Iranian youth found innovative ways to navigate the strict dress codes imposed after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. This period marked a creative adaptation within the framework of Islamic law, reflecting a blend of traditional values and desire for personal expression. For women, the hijab remained a mandatory part of their attire in public, but it became a canvas for personal expression. Young women started experimenting with the scarves in a variety of colors, patterns, and fabrics, moving away from the traditional black. These scarves were also styled in slightly different ways, allowing a bit of hair to show at the front or on the sides, which was a subtle form of self-expression within the limits of the law. Mantos also saw a transformation. While they were still loose and, and long to adhere to the strict dress codes, they also, they also started to have it in a wider range of colors, cuts, and designs. Some women preferred brighter colors and patterns, which was a significant shift from the dark colors seen in the years immediately following the revolution. Men, on the other hand, embraced more stylish cut shirts and jeans. The introduction of slimmer fit jeans and casual but smart shirts allowed young men to engage with global fashion trends with ex within the acceptable standards of modesty. Western style clothing, though still seen with some suspicion, began to make a comeback in the wardrobes of the youth, signaling the shift towards a more individualized fashion sense. The period also saw a rise in the underground fashion shows and shops that sold Western style clothing. These venues became a space where the youth could explore global, global fashion trends discreetly. The underground fashion scene was vibrant with private shows often held in secret locations, showcasing designs that blended Iranian and Western influences creatively. This movement wasn't just about fashion, it was a subtle form of resistance and a statement of cultural identity, reflecting a yearning to be part of the global community while navigating the restrictions of their own. The rise of social media in the late 2000s and early 2010s significantly altered how fashion was consumed, created, and shared. Instagram and te Telegram in particular have played important roles in this transformation. Instagram became a window to the world's fashion trends, allowing Iranian youth to not only observe, but also participate in global fashion trends. Iranian youth started creating their feeds with images showing their personal style, which often included a mix of traditional Iranian elements and modern fashion trends. Women began to share in innovative ways to, to styling their hijabs, incorporating vibrant colors, unique fabrics, and diverse wrapping techniques that adhere to the dress code while showing their own individuality. Telegram was also used in Iran due to its strong privacy features and became a hub for creating and sharing fashion content. Channels and groups were dedicated to, to fashion, offering tips, tutorials, and discussions on the latest trends. Here, users were able to find information on underground fashion shops, pop-up shops selling designers, and advice on where to find materials and clothing that allowed for self-expression within the confinements of the law. The social media era also saw the rise of young designers and fashion entrepreneurs who used these platforms to launch and promote their brands. 
These individuals often started with small home-based operations, selling their creations directly to consumers through Instagram or Telegram. They offered custom designed clothing that blended traditional Iranian fashion with modern styles, challenging the standard definition of modest fashion in Iran. This approach not only provided a platform for showing their work, but it also enabled them to build a direct relationship with their audience. Currently, despite the regulations, young Iranians have carved out a space for personal expression that navigates the official dress codes while engaging with global fashion trends. For women, the hijab has transformed from a simple garment into a versatile accessory that reflects individual style and preference. This transformation is evident in a diverse area of styles now visible in urban areas, from the turban style, which wraps around the head, which covers the hair and the neck, to the loosely draped scarf that allows for a more relaxed fit. The fabrics range from the lightweight cotton range for everyday wear to the luxurious silks, silk, silks for formal occasions with patterns that include both traditional Persian floral and geometric designs, as well as modern, abstract, and pop culture inspired prints. The manteau has also evolved, evolved becoming a statement piece that balances modesty with fashion forward design. Tailored fits, asymmetric cuts, and innovative closures offer a modern twist on this traditional garment. Colors have branched out from the conventional dark palettes to include the pastels, neutrals, and even vibrant hues. Among men, the incorporation of streetwear elements into daily attire signif signifies a shift to a more relaxed and expressive style. Sneakers that once considered were too casual are now the forefront of men's fashion, often paired with slim fit jeans or trousers. Graphic tees offer a canvas for personal and cultural expressions. Accessories also play a crucial role in personalizing these trends. For women, statement jewelry, stylish handbags, and designer adds a layer of individuality to their outfits. Men too have embraced accessories with watches, braces, and hats serving not only for functional purposes, but also as expressions of personal style. Social media continues to be a significant driver of fashion trends among Iranian youth, with influencers and fashion bloggers showing unique styles and inspiring others. This digital platform has enabled the youth to stay connected with global fashion trends while exp experimenting with local adaptations, fostering a vibrant and continuously evolving. So I have a question for you, Maria. What role did the Iranian fashion police play in the emergence of this fashionable Iran? Uh, no, I'm what I'm sort of really intending is that how did this sort of contestation between the fashion police and citizen intensify this sort of women's self assertion in public? and sort of be increasingly fashionable in order to sort of punch back. I guess it made them more, I think they just encouraged them more, they're showing their hair and they're trying to develop their values. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it, adding for your this PhD situation, <laughs> adding the fashion police and the dynamic interaction back and forth would be really interesting. Isn't it? The, the suggestion is that at some point people did not wear watches. I mean, you, you say that at a certain point people started wearing watches, so does that mean earlier they didn't? Because that could make a difference with how one seems the vice was fine. Did, did, did that have an effect on professionals at all? Like, for many people, wearing a watch is completely essential, especially for mobile phones. So did it did it have an effect on how people divide up their days or rest the issue? Clear Yeah. 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 It's not the watch Okay. Um Patty Madison kindly decided not to present so that we can accommodate um, Arash Zargar's 
unveiling emotions in Rumi's poetry, a sentiment analysis approach in the digital humans, please. And you're loading your slides. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present a little bit about my recent work. Uh, so basically we started our work. Okay, thank you. We started our work uh, looking at uh, like how we can sort of integrate new artificial intelligence uh, systems and then use them to sort of do some analysis on uh, Iranian poetry. And then we, we are trying to sort of extract some uh, sort of meaning and emotions from uh, Iranian literature uh, using these artificial intelligence tools. Uh, so one of the like most powerful sort of tools that recently has been developed are large language models, which you have most probably uh, heard about those. For example, GPT, chat GPT is one of those large language models. Large language model is a computer algorithm that has developed to sort of understand uh, human language. Uh, it, they can also generate new texts, uh, which they have not seen before, which is very interesting. And then they can also sort of understand the meaning behind the language. And uh, these language models, they have two characteristics, which are very important. First of all, they are scalable. What it means, it means that we can analyze millions, thousands of lines of text within a very short period of time, and then try to understand what the, what those texts are talking about or what are the emotions behind those texts. And also they are sort of multilingual. Uh, recently they have been developed based on like different languages, which they really help us to sort of translate different languages or sort of use them to understand uh, like uh, the meaning behind like in sentences in different languages. So we were thinking to sort of use these tools to uh, understand, to sort of understand the Iranian literature. One of the first questions that we asked uh, we wanted to sort of find uh, to sort of find correlation. We wanted to see if we can find like correlation between meters that are used in Iranian poetry and also emotions behind poems. So we wanted to use these language models, analyze large text, and then see if we can find, for example, uh, like a correlation between the meter that is used like more often uh, and then emotions behind the sort of uh, the text, Iranian poetry. So to sort of, uh, like for the start of our uh, sort of analysis, we started with uh, Molana and uh, his great book, uh, Divan Shams. The reason that we started with that book is that uh, Divan Shams is basically, uh, in Divan Shams we have uh, more than 50 meters uh, and like 13 meters that have not been like had not been used previous to that. So that that is like a little bit special in terms of utilizing those meters. So we started with Divan Shams. We had like a data set from Divan Shams all the poems we have like in, in uh, Iranian, so, so in, in Farsi. And uh, we used 
some sort of a classical uh, sort of classical analysis in using artificial intelligence, which is called sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis originally developed to understand users of uh, like uh, users of like everything that they put comment uh, after using uh, some sort of a device or something on Amazon or uh, like social media to analyze their feeling about that product. So these sentiment analysis algorithms have been developed to analyze the feeling of users. So what sentiment analysis algorithm does is that they get like the comments of the reviewers as input and what they return is a number from one to five. One would be sad, five would be happy. So if the user's comment is like uh, is for example, I love that product, then the sentiment analysis algorithm returns a five grade. If it's like, for example, I hated that, it, it will return grade one. So for these two sentences, it is pretty easy to understand what is the sentiment behind that. But the sentiment analysis basically did not like, uh, uh, did not uh, basically wait it at that point, they have developed very, very much so that they can analyze large text and then understand the total sentiment behind those. One of these algorithms that have been developed by Google is called BERT. Uh, BERT, multilingual, uh, BERT multilingual sentiment analysis model is a very uh, modern, a model which has been developed especially for extracting these sentiments. So this is the flow chart that how this BERT model works. Basically, we, as I told, we input some text. It starts first by cleaning the text. Cleaning means, for example, it deletes stop words, uh, something like as or with or something like this, which they do not carry that much information. It also like eliminates all the punctuations and does some other analysis, which I can explain more if you are interested. Then it input it input that process text into its engine and it creates some numbers. Based on those numbers, it basically predicts what is the sentiment behind it. So we ask this question, is it possible to use these tools since they are multilingual, multilingual tools? Is it possible to be, like use these tools to understand what is the sentiment behind each poem of Molan? And then classify each of the meters to understand if that meter is utilized to sort of uh, compose sad poems or like happy poems. So uh, we took this model and then developed uh, like these two using which we input this original text is this. This is translation, by the way. Everything that is on this like page is generated by these language models. So uh, like except the original text. So we input this original text into the system. It basically generates this number for us. If you read, I like give a little bit of time for you to read these, which are the translation, which I translated this with GPT-4 model, which is the one of the like most modern models, language models. So it generates these one or five numbers, which shows if the language model or if the system computer understands the meaning of this poem, as a sad poem or as a, a happy poem. So after developing this, we imported all of the Vanishams into this system. And interestingly, the system analyzed the poems and then after that, it returned that almost 80%, more than 80% of the poems are recognized as sad poems by the system. So this graph shows the, uh, these are the meters. 
So, and then these are the average sentiment score uh, based on the Divana Shams. So basically what it shows is that, for example, this meter, which is Mostaf Elum Mostaf has been used to generate more happy concepts in Divana Shams compared to the compared to this one, which it has like lower sentiment score. Or if I show this graph to you, this graph shows how many uh, grade five poems are like under each of these meters. So basically another parameter that shows which like uh, which uh, meter is is utilized to generate more happy concepts compared to the other ones which are utilized to sort of generate sad concepts. We have done another analysis which we sort of calculated a parameter which is called entropy under each of these. Uh, so one of the concepts is how many happy poems are under each of the meters. The other concept is each of the meter, so maybe one of them allows the poet to use that meter to generate grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, five, all of them together. So it shows that that meter has more potential in terms of being utilized to generate different sentiments. But some of the meters are utilized only for grade one. Concept. So we call this entropy, and then we analyze this entropy as well for different meters. Uh, uh, so you may ask, so why why this result? The first time that I showed these results uh, to our colleagues and uh, to like in, in this group, they said it is a little bit strange that. Uh, the language model is basically absorbing that information as being that like, poems as being 80%, 90% negative. So there are, we have some hypotheses to sort of explain what is happening. There are like three reasons that they may sort of contribute to this analysis. The first one is that maybe there are a lot of metaphors in the language that the language models cannot sort of recognize those metaphors. The other reason is that maybe like the changes in language is contributing to those results, meaning that these language models have been trained with the data that is present on the internet and those data like the majority of that data has been created recently. So our recent language may be different with the language that Molana used to develop his poems. So maybe that's, that's one of these. Uh, or the other hypothesis is that maybe, maybe those results are correct. Maybe 80% of those are correct. But to sort of understand those, we have these future steps. First, first of all, we need to find some ground truth, some analytics data that has been utilized by human, special, specialized human, so that we can compare our system results with those. The other thing is that we can get, we, we are planning to get uh, like a, a more contemporary poets, uh, Parvin et Sami, which also use those meters to sort of compose her poems and then analyze Parvin et Sami's poem to see if uh, if it is like uh, like a matter of time because Parvin et Sami is more sort of com contemporary we should see some differences if if it is a matter of sort of language change um, the other thing is that uh, one of the applications that we are seeing for these sort of analysis is that there are some uh, translated versions from Mola, for example, in French, in English. We can input those translated version and then analyze which one has uh, like a better translation in terms of 
translating the sentiment of each poem correctly. So we have the sentiments in Farsi, we can generate the sentiments in different languages, different translated versions, and then decide this translation seems to be better because it is creating those sentiments better. And then uh, we have some like other applications as well. For example, we, we like the social media uh, data is also like accessible. We can find which poems are basically more famous or which poems have been shared after some specific time or events and then analyze the sentiments of those points and then do some analysis of the feeling of people as well. Uh, like for contemporary sort of uh, poets, another analysis that we can do is if we have the, uh, what has happened to those poems during their, their, uh, during their lives, we can understand if they have composed sad or happy poems after specific like uh, social events, for example. Then we can understand if that poet was happy after a specific event or sad. Uh, yeah, thank you. For, thank you so much. This is, these are the results. Thank you very much, Arash. Great work. So I don't know very much about AI, so this is a stupid question to you. Mm -hmm. um, but as much as I know, I know that the results you get from this language analysis is very much, very much dependent on the way you train that or the way you stand on that. So the, the and I also know that if you get um, these sorts of over 80%, 90%, then you might actually you need to check the way you do that because it's very easy. So how did you train this machine? Because you said not everyone on the internet would read the points and then they said one, two, three. Okay, so could you share the screen again and then I, I'll explain how, how it has been uh, trained. So it's a little bit like the reason that I didn't explain it. It's it, it's a little bit like, uh, sort of complicated. Com not not complicated. I don't want to say complicated <laughs> because so uh, let's say in 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 English language we have let's assume that in English language we have only six words. Uh, five are these. And then one is, I don't know, let's say, spoon, something like spoon. Uh, we have a 2D diagram. Computers can only understand numbers. If we want to talk to computers, we need to create representation, numeric representation for each word. Let's say we have Honda and Ford, and we have lion and cat. We know that lion and cat are more like conceptually they are sim more similar than Honda and Ford, right? So we know this. So if we want to represent numerically these numbers, it would be rational if we put these two closer to each other, like the numeric representation of these two closer and these two closer, right? How about Jaguar? If you want to add Jaguar to your words, then Jaguar is a, is a sort of animal, it also is here as well, right? So where do we put those? So what we do, this is a 2D analysis. If we have a three dimension, which is the here, we have spoon and jaguar. You can put jaguar closer to all of these and then a spoon far further, mm -hmm. right? So in 2010, people started to think how many dimensions they need to define the words, like all of the words that are present in English language. So in Stanford University, they have created something, something called GLOV. GLOV is global vector. Global vector means that all of the words that are present in English language all of them have some representation, numeric representation, right? 
And then they have extended that to all languages. So I didn't train anything. The data has been trained by Google with all the texts that are present in Farsi language on internet. So they have created these maps, like these numeric representation for each words that are present in Farsi language on the internet. And then using those, machine can understand <clears throat> where are these words in those like multidimensional space. So here we have, for example, 100 elements. 100 elements means that we have 100 dimensions. 100 is a like, pretty good number in terms of like optimizing things. But the thing is that at the end of the day, we have representation for each word. And those representation, we can like, uh, basically computer can understand what is the sentiment because it can find the words that are closer to all of the words in a text, right? So I didn't, I didn't train anything. I just used the trained version of the language model from Google. So I'm pretty sure that the language model is correct, but the thing is that it has been trained with the current data on the internet. Now to follow up that question, uh, when we, we think of uh, codic sentence, often are much more complex than happy, exactly. sad, <laughs> angry, laughter, cry, and you may have situation of Gary Handy that you are crying, which is not sad. Exactly. And those complex sentiments that do not find fall within the grade one through five, how do you capture that? Particularly in poetry, I think you have much more complex rather than simple sort of categorization of. Uh, so uh, to answer that, this is the first step that we are using this large language models to see if they are able to capture meaning in Farsi poetry with those like mm -hmm. complex metaphors. But the next step would be, we can define those feelings. So for example, there are some literature, I was doing literature review, people are defining some words to sort of represent different feelings that, uh, that uh, a poet can basically uh, can basically sort of uh, say in in their uh, in their poetry, and then instead of analyzing to happy or sad, we are seeing like uh, the the meaning of the poet is closer to which of the words, which are representations of the feelings. So let's say we have ten words like uh 10 words let's say which represents the the like different feelings of poets i don't know something like um may, maybe happy and angry are 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 part of those then we have like other feelings as well and then we f we find out like the meaning is more closer to which of those words because those words also have numeric representations, right? And then we can capture the numeric representations of, of a poem and then compare with these like words and then see which one is closer. May, I, so may I interject for a second, if you don't mind? Yes, please, chat now. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm doing this uh, over Zoom, uh, Arashan, because I had to come home, but I just wanted to pop in because I've been in the meetings that we've had, um, uh, we've had with uh, with Arash and the rest of our AI team. Now, the key issue here is that we are just starting to figure out how to incorporate a meter into any kind of AI analysis. And this is this is the crucial step because we haven't done that before. So we have done all kinds of language examinations, but we have no basis for including A one kind of analysis of meter into analysis of, of words in poetry. So not only was that the sentiment is pretty simplified, 
but we are actually establishing a basis with that, like the, the, the simplified sentiment allows us to establish a baseline for what we can do with these 50 giant meters, because then these meters are what the connecting tissue between Shams and Parveen and all across the Persian poetry, they become shared language of poetry. And then moving on to modern language would allow us not only to test our, our analysis of the meter, but also to add to those kind of language of sentiment too, because then we will figure out, oh, if in Parveen, the same meter that Arash is finding that in Shams produces mostly also called sad poetry, comes down and in Parveen produces actually quite mixed results. Then there's something going on with our sentiment, with our yeah. course. But, 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 but here it seems to me that the attention, while on words, it has to go beyond it into syntax. Exactly. And rhythm and verses and the structure of those. Exactly. Because the complexity cannot be captured through exactly. focusing on single words, but the combination of words. Exactly. And, yeah. There are some other analysis. We haven't done that, but there are some other analysis which they call like sort of classification. Yeah. We can classify a text into different sort of meanings right. without telling the system that what are those meanings. We just tell the system, classify this, and it starts clustering like similar points with similar meaning into like different clusters. Then we go to a cluster, we understand that, okay, these are clustered because they are representing that feeling. Maybe the next step is to tell the system to just cluster them based on the meaning. And then maybe we can sort of like separate between like different feelings, not just happy and sad, because system can, can generate multiple clusters, but they are more advanced sort of analysis. This is just the first step for us to see if, if these language models are sort of applicable to Persian poetry mm -hmm. with those complex metaphors. So I was hoping that we can actually recruit our students into contributing exactly in those ways or start to this project that they can come into the project and actually help us because we have done the clustering for Furu poetry and they can pick up these these kind of tasks that our AI team really very much depends on the humanities scholars to do for them and kind of get engaged with oh that 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 cluster of meaning in Asir actually has this thing attached to it uh, based on their reading, based on their scholarship that they know. So um, this was kind of a coming here with whatever they've done and trying to see how much brainstorming we can do to kind of push it to do a lot of other things with it. Would it be possible to, as you work on this, sort of bring in various sort of commentaries on on Divan, Divan Shams, or on uh, uh, Molana's work, so that with the commentaries, then you may come up with a much more complex kind of uh, situation that I have in mind, which is that the commentaries that are on each line and each verse, there's a commentary, and those commentaries could be integrated as an index yes. of sentiment, but also mode of intellectual activities that are there, because it's not just emotive, it also triggers various mode of thinking and sharing those thoughts. Yes, that's a very good <laughs> so bring very good the idea. Yes, 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 it is possible. Into the, yes, it's into possible. the structure of emotive analysis. It is possible, yeah. yes. Even, even for each for each uh, like line, we can do that. Yeah. Another analysis that I wanted to, I was interested to do, I wanted to see how the sentiments form inside one poem. Yeah. So maybe Molana starts like, like uh, poems under one specific meter, 
with happy sentiments goes to neutral and then goes to sad with other meter like again yeah. like it changes those flow of the sentiments yeah. Yeah. we can definitely integrate those commentaries so we can analysis. start with this the pandemic did all it to darman and manas the ranged rohat zaman is in don manas and get all the commentaries on this and the musical everything sort of and then link them to one another yes. and see what Yes, what exactly. happens rather than focusing on the tang, the dar, darman, man, rang, rok, zamane, zendan, because you will get a radically different kind of yes interpretation yes. by moving beyond just words. Uh, one last comment is that for for full poems, what we were doing was based on the words. Here with dirt, this model works with meanings, right. meanings of poem, not each of these right, right, wo right, vocals. Right, right. But the thing is that another thing that we are thinking about is that if we shuffle these words, for example, put deltang in another place and then didar in another place, if we remove these connections, and then give that just the words, shuffled words to our system. Then analyze the sentiment that system is returned. Using this method, we can understand if system is deciding just based on the words or based on the connections between those. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some sort of like maybe five, six months that I'm working with system I personally believe it can understand the connections are very important for the system right. as well. So it means that the system is sort of interpreting the meaning behind the poem. It's not just about the, like the wording of poems. So this system is, is one step further. For, so we are going one step after another. This is the first step in integrating the meaning of the poems using this. Right. Systems. Good work. Thank you. Keep up the great. I really enjoyed your presentations. Very inspiring, everyone. Keep up the good work, and I look forward to your published articles. Will we email you? Yes, please. Do. Soon. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good yeah. dissertation topic. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh. um, but I, I think I'm